Um, I'm Brooks Davis. I'm with SRI International, and I'm part of the team of researchers working on the, uh, on the Cherry Project, which I'll get into in a moment. I'm here to talk to you today about Cherry BSD, which is our fork of FreeBSD to support the Cherry processor. Um, it's in many ways similar to, for instance, the Trusted BSD project or the, the Hardened BSD project, and that we're going off in another direct. We're going off in a direction that you know FreeBSD isn't ready for for one reason or another. Um, in the case of Trusted BSD, it was that there was large swaths of fairly disruptive technology that had to be proved out at scale before they could be merged into the tree, before you're going to make changes to thousands of places in the code. Um, Cherry BSD is a little different in that Cherry BSD is about porting FreeBSD to a new CPU with new instruction, with new instructions, a new C compiler, um, some significant changes to the C language, and uh, so a wide variety of things that obviously we can't just dump in the FreeBSD tree. Um, if nothing else, you can't buy the CPU. So um, people might object to large scale changes uh, for something you can't even use. Um, but first, a little background. Um, you know, as hardly a week goes by where you don't hear about some new, you know, malware, some new breach or malware problem or whatever, you know, Anthem losing 80 million customer records, um, the uh, banks losing uh, hundreds of millions of dollars um, in things like the target breach, um, or the, uh, I think this one actually is a, if I remember right when I created this slide, this is a reference to the banks simply failing to notice um, hundreds of millions of dollars in fraudulent transactions that were made to move money to another bank, and then they took the money out. Poof. Um, or the most, one of the most recent ones, the Office of Personnel Management uh, in the US, basically HR for the civilian part of the US government, they lost 3.2 million HR records. Um, so basically everything you need to know to steal someone's identity. Uh, so this is, this is the daily reality of uh, computing and the internet. So we decided it was time to do something about it a bit. Um, the approach we're taking is one that's been taken for quite a while, which is application compartmentalization. Um, compartmentalization decomposes software into isolated components. Um, you know, the, uh, and uh, each sandbox runs with only the rights needed, so you can allow a least privilege approach. Um, one common example of this that you probably as Unix users use every day is SSH has privilege separation um, so that the most risky bits that must run as root um, are the, mo the bits that must run as root are separate from the most risky bits that do all the crypto handling or as much as possible. Um, and, the, and the goal here is that you can take an application, you can start with an application like in this example gzip, and you can cut it up into multiple pieces. So the compression logic, which is what people screw up because they write it in tight C code, designed to be fast, designed to trick the compiler into generating the best code they can, um, at least 20 years ago whenever they made those decisions. Um, you can put that off in a process which only has limited rights. Um, in this example, this, this example maps pretty well to Capsicum, which we already have in FreeBSD. It is a process-based framework um, where we have capabilities, which are unforgeable tokens of authority, um, are file handles, very fundamental thing in Unix. And those ca you can enter a capability mode where you cannot open any new file handles through, through uh, arbitrary namespaces. You must obtain them via other capabilities. And you, you, can, um, and you can restrict the rights on the, those capabilities. So for instance, in the gzip example, what gzip does in its most basic mode is it opens one file and it opens another file handle creates a new file, and it does a bunch of work and then copy, moves data from one side to the other. You obviously don't want the input file to be writable. You don't want the output file to be readable, or that's probably fairly harmless, but in principle, you don't really want that. Um, Capsicum works great for something like gzip. It works great for OpenSSH, where the existing framework was already, the existing privilege separation was already based around Unix principles. Um, but it doesn't scale to the kind of things you might want to do. For example, um, in a web browser, right now a web browser like Chromium has a separate process for each tab, at least until you open too many of them. The problem is that you can't, if you have too many processes, you start to run out of TLB entries on your CPU. Um, I know of 
one instance where, in addition to running out of TLB ad entries, um, some systems are running out of address space identifiers. Um, so even though their processes are often quite small, if you have too many of them, you still get TLB misses simply because you've, uh, you've had to reuse an address space identifier. Um, so there's some serious scaling problems. And, and that's even just with tabs. What you'd actually like is to render every image in your browser in a separate sandbox so that when something does go wrong, the email that was sent to you with a bad, that somebody sent you that had a bad image invent, or embedded in it can't read your bank statements, can't hijack your password reset URLs, all of which are in your email and all of which are in that tab and in that process. So we're trying to make this, we want to make this scale. So we're doing, doing that in hardware. So as I was saying, with process separation, you can have this, this uh, you can avoid this problem where you have one process here, it has a pointer to a buffer in some other part of the program or in some other part of the application. If it's in another process, this arrow doesn't work. Um, and we'd like to do that at the application level, in the single application, and have that mechanism for every pointer. So we can have every C object be a separate thing that you cannot manufacture a pointer to. So with Cherry, we are doing that um, with capabilities. So we've created fat point, we've created fat pointers. These are 256-bit pointers. Um, yes, that's big. Um, so each pointer has an offset, which is essentially, which is in practice the pointer. Um, it is it is where you're pointing in memory, um, and you have a base and a length, which are relative to your virtual address space. And there's guarded manipulation of this, which means that you can, only so you can only create a capability by deriving it from another capability. And the only derivations that are allowed are to shrink it. So you can increment the base and move, move up in address space, or you can shrink the length. You can also reduce the permissions of the pointer. Um, one important thing here, though, is that, and the reason we have an offset, in our initial design, we did not have an offset. Um, it turned out that in real-world C code, that's not OK, because you can't just keep shrinking your, your data. Because what you do is if you see an application, a program like FFmpeg, inside libav codec, there is code where they pass a pointer to the middle of a piece of data to be decoded, because the compiler generates better code that way, because it can use small positive and negative intermediates. Um, so we have this offset, which allows our capability is to be near perfect replacements of C pointers. Um, and the reason this works is that the off you only check that the offset is inside the bank that base and length at dereference time. Now, so we, as, I said, as I alluded, we want these to be C pointers. So we've, we've done that. Um, and we have two modes where you can use them. One is a hybrid mode. This is where you have conventional, in our case, MIP64 code and you annotate some of the pointers in your code as being capabilities. Um, that means the compiler saves more space for them, uses the correct manipulation instructions to access them, and uh, works. So you can, you, can do, you can use this in code if you want to just protect a small, a few buffers that are very, very important. Um, but it is a lot of work. Um, we made some changes to TCP dump, and I'll talk a little more about them later, um, where I added bounds to the buffer that was, uh, to, the, to the packet buffer that was being dissected. And that worked, but that was many days of unpleasant, uh, unpleasant changes to the code and thousands of changes. Um, so we ended up adding um, pure cap a pure capability mode where every pointer is a capability. Um, so in, in, in translation units or files that are compiled <laughs> In this mode, all pointers are 256 bits. They're all bounds checked. Almost all bounds are correctly inferred. Um, so if you malloc something, you get a pointer that's exactly the size of the object that you, al you allocated. Um, if you try to go outside the bounds, things go boom in a nice predictable way rather than uh, randomly corrupting your memory. So as I say, we have a, a sort of a a, a range of ABIs here. So we have the pure MIP64. This is conventional FreeBSD runs on this processor without modification. Um, 
And if you use it in this mode, you get no benefits, but it also doesn't require any work. The important part is to work your way through. Um, and so there's a bunch of different approaches we can take. But uh, we have a lot of hybrid code today and some pure capability code. We're increasingly moving towards pure capability code. Um, and here, here's an example of the sort of things we can support with the processor. So this is sort of our, this is our current situation for the most part, um, where we have a conventional kernel. It's running standard MIX64 code. We have a conventional application also running MIX standard MIPS64 code. And we have Zlib in a compartment. Um, Zlib's chosen because it has a small interface and it was easy um, and it compiled. Um, and it has pure capability code inside and then a little hybrid wrapper around the outside that lets us call in. The application, I um, mean, one, one example that we've talked about in one of our papers um, is uh, GIF to PNG, doesn't know that the library is protecting it. And in fact, there's essentially no performance impact in this case. Um, but if there's a bug in Zlib, it will fail stop. Um, and even if, it somehow, even if it doesn't manage to fail stop, the, uh, it's very difficult to gain control um, in the application. You know, if it's a pure within the bounds of C control flow bug. You can also see a world which we're working right now actively to add pure capability applications, which means a new, yet another syscall interface. Um, and pure libraries. One interesting thing, though, and this, this example actually isn't ideal, um, but uh, one of the interesting things is we can put conventional MIP64 code, say, to a binary library that we don't have any source code to, for either because we bought it from someone who doesn't want to give us source code or because we lost the source code, which I've heard of some large internet companies doing. Um, and we can put that in a little sandbox, and we can have a, a wrapper interface. So our library can be pure, even though we have this bit that we don't have any control over, it can't get out of its sandbox. So it's less likely to fail stop if something goes horribly wrong, but what it can do is very little. Um, it has access to a few, you know, it might have, if it's say, a video code, a proprietary video codec, all it can do is write the wrong video frames um, and read some video frames, which it was supposed to be doing anyway. Um, there's also, um, you can go farther along and of course, you know, start writing a microkernel, having a single, single address space application. Um, lots of neat things, but we're quite a ways from that. Um, if nothing else, LLVM doesn't yet compile MIP64 in a way that's usable for a kernel. Um, so, just a little bit more on the CPU. We have a prototype CPU. Um, it's a 64-bit MIPS CPU, um, sort of R4K, so nicely out of patent. Um, it has the Cherry ISA extensions that I've been talking about. It runs at 100 megahertz, which is a bit slow, but you know, we lived with it in the 90s. Um, and we actually have quite a bit more RAM, which helps, although, you know, we have a gig of RAM on the boards and could have four gigs of RAM, um, which would have been a little unimaginable when I was in college, um, which is, is mostly good, except occasionally it gets a little exciting. One of, the, one of the early bugs we had was a bug in the SD card controller that we got from the FPGA manufacturer that if you wrote a byte to the buffer two cycles in a row, it threw the second one away. Said you didn't. It, there literally was code in there that said we got two writes in a row. Throw it away. Uh, we commented that out, and it works better. Um, but uh, one interesting thing is we only found this problem after reboot because we had so much RAM that the entire file system fit in the buffer cache. So it was only when we flushed the buffer cache by rebooting the machine that we discovered that we'd corrupted the on-disk data structures. And, and Fisk would say, oh, what have you done to this poor file system? Um, so it's an interesting, uh, one of the interesting challenges here. Um, but the neat thing here that we have is that we have this CPU, we have this operating system that I'm gonna talk more about, and we have a modified LLVM, so we can run real software. And that's where things get exciting. Um, we can really test things out. So Cherry BSD is, of course, the, uh, the BSD to support Cherry. Um, it's a mix of platform support, which is to say, 
drivers for things on the FPGA um, and peripherals, it's, uh, which is the Berry CPU. You can, you can compile our CPU without the cherry bits if you want. It's open source. Um, and if you want to do things like run an operating, run, run a, uh, a, a hardware class, you can you know, use that fairly simple CPU and add things like a better branch predictor as an exercise. And people at Cambridge have done that. Um, so there's also support for the new ISA features. Um, I'll give you a little rundown of sort of how much changes that was in a bit. Um, there's in infrastructure to support the compartmentalization of libraries or whatever it is you want to stick in a, in a compartment. Um, there are some custom out applications. Uh, I'll talk more about, uh, about TCP dump and a few others. Um, and then there are a bunch of build system improvements um, because we're doing lots of slightly weird things. So, um, so things like, so we, we've, we've done a lot of work, like we have the ability to build FreeBSD and install it in a directory without any privilege, um, which is now being used in parts of the release build infrastructure. Um, we did it because we wanted to have grad students and grad students building Cherry BSD, and I didn't want to give them root um, and, and mess up our fan nice fancy machines. Um, so here's a snapshot of our, of our page on GitHub. So you notice almost 6,000 changes here um, relative to FreeBSD, and we're actually farther, so, and that's, there's more, quite a few more than 6,000 now, that was a week ago. Uh, and we're a bit behind, we merge periodically, talk quite a bit more about merging. Um, but the main thing is, and what makes, what I think makes our project interesting is that we are, comp we, are we both want this to be publicly accessible, because we have collaborators, but we, so, which means we can't do things like rebase. Um, but we also are, you know, we've merged probably 200 changes or 300 changes out of this tree. So we have this huge set of changes that we have to maintain over time, which leads to some challenges in version control. Um, so next up, here's a, here's a breakdown of the kernel changes. This was in our paper at IEEE Security and Privacy. Um, so we, you know, we added a bunch of headers, lots of various things, lots of access to assembly functions. Um, there's some setup in the some setup of Cherry in the kernel, basically saying, turn it on. Um, you know, give me the default capability. Which at boot, there's a default capability, which is the address space, and you can start chopping that up uh, later. There's context switch code because our new our new uh, capabilities have to go into special registers, so we need to save and restore those registers. There's exception handling because we've created all sorts of new ways to cause exceptions since now a de an out of bounds pointer dereference uh, is a trap. Um, there's you know, some memory management, memory copying, swap. Um, there's some support for the actual compartmentalization bit, which is somewhat separate from the memory safety. Um, bit for system calls, bit for signal delivery, et cetera. A um, few thousand lines of code, which actually is not too bad, because FreeBSD is several million lines of kernel code. Um, and we've actually written a very tiny little microkernel before that's not very big, although I don't even think it works anymore. So in addition to kernel changes, of course, had to make some tweaks to the runtime. Um, the uh, first, the biggest thing is memcopy and memmove need to be capability aware, even in capability oblivious code. Um, one of the interesting things here, and one of the reasons why it's really important to have a team as large as we do, is actually our first version of the ISA didn't allow you to implement memcopy efficiently. Um, you actually would have had to check every 256-bit chunk of memory to see whether or not it was a capability and then copy it with capability instructions or copy it with regular instructions. That would be insane. Um, so you can now use capability instructions to copy non-capability memory. Um, and it actually turns out that FreeBSD's generic memcopy and memmove implementations in C um, required almost no changes. We just had to tell it, oh, just use the right size as the basic word size when doing copies and it generates the right code. Um, I was actually pleasantly surprised. Uh, we, of course, have assembly versions as well that are a little better, but that's the basic. The, the nice thing is with the C integration, we get a lot of that. Um, we also had to add explicit versions 
for, for hybrid code, we had to have explicit versions of things like string and memory manipulation functions um, so that we could have a mix of arguments. Um, that, I think, I'm not sure that's going to stay. Um, but in our current infrastructure, that's how it has to be. Um, and then there were a bunch, there's a bunch of interesting cases, like in current C code, like in the Sterlin function, it assumes that once it's aligned to the front of the, aligned to the front to the uh, size of a word, then it can always read whole words. But we have byte granularity, um, we, have, we have byte granularity restrictions. So if you read, if you can definitely read the next byte, that doesn't mean you can definitely read the rest of the word. Um, so that had to be fixed, it was easy to do, but um, required a bit of change. Um, and one thing that we're working on right now is taking the syscall implementation in libc and moving it into a lib syscalls. So yes, I'm going to be asking for uh, x, x runs on the ports at some point here, because that's going to be exciting. Um, but uh, it'll both help us, because inside a sandbox, we, want to, we may want to attempt to make syscalls and have the kernel mediate. Um, based on some new configuration that's capsicum-like. Or we may want to have something that just simply proxies the syscalls back to the uh, privileged part of the application. It, it can make, make the decisions. Um, it's also be useful for people like Google, who are you know, building Android with FreeBSD, um, and their syscall layer is obviously totally different. So the separation, I think, will be generally useful. Um, the next bit, bits for compartmentalization. So, Libcherry is the library for creating sandboxed libraries. Um, it's, or for, for creating sandboxes, um, you can instantiate an object, you can instantiate objects, you can give them types, um, and then you can allocate, the, allocate copies of the object, do resets, that sort of thing. Um, so that's sort of the, the core functionality for implementing compartmentalized libraries or compartmentalized TCP dump, for instance. Um, it also has a loader and a runtime linker. Um, since objects have a new calling convention and we want to, uh, and, and we don't want to have to write um, horrible little RPC-like things where you say, well, I'm going to pass eight integer arguments and eight capability arguments and try to remember how, which ones go where and whatnot. We did that for a while. It sucked. Um, we're also uh, yeah, working on a syscall. It also includes some syscall implementation bits so compartments can call out to an object in the privileged process. Something with a confusingly similar name, um, we have uh, the libcherry directory. This is where peer capability versions of libraries live. It's also where the, the, cap the objects live. It's a lot like the 32-bit support for 64-bit machines. Um, in fact, I copied and pasted this stuff in makefile.inc1. Uh, one reason why merges suck uh, is lots of churn in that file. Um, so. And eventually, right, right now, we're only using those libraries to build little compartmentalized libraries that have a hybrid outside interface. Um, longer term, the plan is to have pure capability libraries. So as part of your transition from a conventional ISA to Cherry, you'll be able to pick points along the way, not only at the library level, but at the application level. So you can have your most important or well, either most important or easiest to modify um, applications be pure capability. And other applications can, uh, and, and, and other applications can, can remain as they are. You can still have, you know, your, your binary only whatever program it is that you have. Um, so we also have demo applications. This is a screenshot here of a, or a picture here of a, the, the uh, sort of very weak PowerPoint-like program that I wrote um, as a demo. Um, so we, we actually gave our talk to DARPA at, at the principal investigators meeting on our tablet, um, which you can see Robert holding here. And when we got to the end, we said, and, and you know, one more thing. Um, we're running on our, not only are we running on our hardware, but the slide deck has an exploit in it. Um, and triggered a Trojan, and Cherry successfully defeated the Trojan. Not that it was very hard, um, since I wrote all of it. But nonetheless, the, te the technology did work, um, and does 
do this. So we, we've got a bunch of little custom applications as part of Cherry BSD. Those don't pre present any particular challenges for us um, in terms of Cherry BSD maintenance. The thing that does present bigger challenges is we're also modifying existing applications. So at one point, we took a look at let's, let's compartmentalize Wireshark. Wireshark's full of vulnerabilities. It's a giant program. We spent a, quite a bit of time on it said, well, that was insane. Um, you know, it's three million lines of code um, and uses glib, and it's all very complicated. So we decided to do TCP dump instead, um, which has the advantage of being in the base, um, which is, is kind of good and bad. So our first version, we had, we had a version that was very simple. We just compartmentalized a section, and it was standard MIPS code on both sides with just a little bit of hybrid code to get in and out of the sandbox. Um, we later added memory safety, which I alluded to before. And that's you know 6,000 lines of changes, a whole lot of not fun. Um, and part of that, though, was actually one of the things that where we learned an interesting lesson, which is that we had no ability. In, in TCP dump, there's a modest amount of code that advances the buffer, advances the buffer, advances the buffer, and then it's, oh, whoops, I forgot. I want something a little back behind my pointer. That's fine in C. That's a perfectly legitimate and reasonable thing to do. However, before we had the offsets, that required, that didn't work because we'd incremented the base, we incremented the base, we incremented the base. Oops, can't go back. That's not allowed. Um, so we, we added offsets. That helped quite a bit. Um, I added per protocol dissector. So this is the super, sort of the, the most protection you could get from TCP dump, in TCP dump, which is to say every protocol lives in its own sandbox. Um, so as you're dissecting, IP goes fine, TCP goes fine, you call into HTTP, or maybe probably more realistically, you call into something like SNMP, the ASN1 parser is broken as it always is um, and gets exploited. Um, you can still trust the TCP and IP dissection. Um, because you've failed in a deeper sandbox. So that required a modest amount of code change. There, you had to change all the call sites. Um, but that's pretty reasonable. We went to pure capability mode. That got rid of tons of annotations, which was nice. Um, and then the pure capability mode, though, removing the annotations was actually driven by the fact that FreeBSD got a new version of TCP dump. So this is one of the things that's really interesting about working on a real world project and keeping your tree up to date is that we learned some lessons about maintainability the hard way. Um, we tried to do this import we were here, and I think, you know, there were 3,600 conflicts in Git. Um, seemed like a bit much. So we uh, made a bunch of changes, got back to here. Um, we added, when we added the linker support, that reduced the amount of junk in the code base. And actually, this has dropped dramatically because somewhat surprisingly, uh, the TCP dump maintainers accepted my change to shuffle a 1,000 lines of code around within the tree and put it in different places so that the interface between the dissectors um, and the front end is both fairly narrow in that it's only five or six functions um, and fairly simple, um, which should help build a better capsicum, capsicumized version of TCP dump, but also um, simplifies my code. We'll see how my next merge goes, because the approach I took when I upstreamed it is a bit different. Um, there's also a bit of infrastructure work we've done. Um, I've alluded to for so the unprivileged builds. Um, we've added some hacks to let us do change the compiler on a per program and per file basis. Um, that's because early on our custom LLVM was not sufficient, was, was not robust enough to actually compile all the code. So we wanted to focus on the code where we could do something interesting um, and then over time, expand it out. It's getting close to being able to compile everything. But uh, I spent the last quite a bit of time the last few weeks trying to compile things and then sending David bug reports uh, when the compiler crashes. Um, and some, some other hacks, like um, which will, will help some upcoming changes, like we, we strip binaries during the build rather than e using the install program, things like that. Um, for more information on sort of the general what's in What's in Cherry BSD, particularly Barry stuff? I suggest reading the journal article that I wrote a few months ago. Um, pretty good. Now on a bit to version to uh, revision control. Um, this is one of the places where we've had a lot of challenges. We started off in Perforce, which was sort of the conventional way that people 
did forks of FreeBSD in the past, supported on FreeBSD project infrastructure, which is good. Um, merging is very good. Um, it really is a good way to maintain something that's a, a fork of FreeBSD in the long term. I've done it at previous jobs as well. And it's easy to maintain what I'm calling here stacked branches. So for a while, we had a Berry BSD, which was the platform bits. Um, and it sat in between Cherry BSD and FreeBSD so that we could try and keep maintain some separation there. Um, we merged everything in the Berry BSD branch um, that wasn't too weird and then got rid of it at some point. But that was nonetheless quite helpful. And our team already knew it. So that was a good reason to stick with Perforce. Downside is Perforce sucks at public access. Um, you have to give people an account to have, give them access to the system. Every checkout involves adding server state. Um, so even if we were willing to give out a lot of accounts, eventually the project would run out of resources. Um, it's very easy to get in a situation where your Perforce server needs to have a half terabyte of RAM. Um, and we probably would have had to buy it for the project in that case. Um, you know, adding users is a bit annoying. And you know, there's the offline support isn't very good. That's not too big a deal, but it's not, it's not good. Um, so in o October 2013, we decided we, were, we needed to have public access. There were people at, say, M at MIT Lincoln Labs and some other places who wanted to start using Cherry BSD. So we wanted to give them direct access to the, re to the repository rather than having to take the time to package up dumps and have to, or pack package up snapshots and push them out and QA them and all that. Um, so we moved over to GitHub. Um, we lost a little history granularity in the process because many of the commits couldn't just be applied one at a time because things had moved on and there'd been merging. Uh, but really not too bad. Um, however, it was a bit of a trial by fire um, for, using with, uh, for using Git sort of at scale. FreeBSD is a bit on the big side for Git um, and our export has some weird features that I'll get to. Um, also, I and Robert, who are the main um, Cherry BSD developers, were not experienced Git users at the time. So lots of excitement. It's not clear that our model was the right model, um, but it's the one we've got. So we're kind of stuck with it. Um, what we ended up doing is we forked the FreeBSD repo on GitHub. Um, one thing that I found is kind of weird about GitHub's forking model is if you want to fork Cherry BSD, it seems that you get a copy of the FreeBSD repo. Um, at least that's what happened when I tried to do it recently. That might simply be because I already have a copy of the FreeBSD repo. Um, but so if someone wants to try it, eh, it's only a gig or so. Uh, GitHub will never notice. Um, but uh, that was a bit odd. Um, and we did all the commits to, our, to the master branch. I'm not sure that's the right solution, but it's what we've done. And at this point, we're stuck. Um, we're not going to do a forced rebase and mess everything up. And then we merge changes from the FreeBSD up, upstream periodically. Um, typically, what the, the typical working model is, we merge changes when we need something. Or after a demo, after, after a big deadline's passed and we realize we're behind, we'll do a merge just to sort of catch up while, we're, while we have some breathing room. Um, so our first attempt is sort of the basic obvious thing that you might, you might think to do is we fetch upstream. We merge master into our current tree, you know, in a branch, but nonetheless, we just merge it. Um, it mostly works. Um, the first few times it went pretty smoothly. Um, there were some sort of strange looking conflicts that I didn't understand at the time, but it worked. Um, we got past them. Um, although one annoying thing that we still not haven't resolved is that rebases go horribly wrong. So if somebody else pushes while you're doing a merge, you just have to throw the merge away. Um, rebases never work um, in this case. So, however, after a few times, we came along, we'd started doing work integrating the VT console stuff into our tablet platform. And I did the merge, everything compiled, everything seemed to work, pushed it, and something was broken in VT. Um, who knows where, it wasn't due to a merge conflict. Um, it was actually due to an API change, it turned out. Um, the problem is, so this is sort of the notional model of how it works. You know, you're going along, you're going along, you're going along. You merge upstream, it's all good. Um, problem is, this is more like it, and this is actually much simpler than reality. Um, 
The reality is you're going along, you're going along, you're going along. Thousands of changes occur. Um, and then you merge from upstream and you pull in another three months of development, which is typically several thousand, you know, th is thousands of changes. Um, and if you try to bisect, well, in, the, in our case, it was an API had changed. So all these were fine, but they don't include any of our code. And all these are fine because the problem was here. Well, here, I guess, technically. Um, and so there's nothing to look for. Um, so that was really annoying. Um, Ed found it eventually. Um, so I, I ignored it for a week. I didn't need out IO, so it was OK. Um, so I wrote a tool um, that I whimsically named Mergeify. Um, it merges one commit at a time, because from the perspective of a consumer of FreeBSD, every change is a feature. That's not perfectly accurate, because sometimes it's a, you know, a commit that's broken, and then another commit that fixes it, or a commit that's broken, and then a few commits, and then a commit that fixes the previous one. There's no way to deal with that case in a sensible way, so I just punted. Um, but merging one commit at a time does help in that the overall system is much, uh, it do does help in that you now have commits you can bisect. Those mer each of those merged commits is useful. Um, the feature I haven't added to the tool yet is something to knock out all of the sort of child commits um, from the bisect. It would be pretty easy to do. I just haven't written it yet. So that you only consider the commits that actually um, change your branch. Um, so one of, the, one of the key things that I figured out over time is that you, from our perspective, it's only those merges that matter. Everything else, it's got some history, who cares? Um, so the first attempt, we just merged every commit. And then TCP come, came along, and there was an update in contrib, and things went really strange. Um, we got these merge results that were completely nuts. Um, mostly, it was the top-level make file would get something from contrib squished into it. Um, turns out that what's happening in the FreeBSD export is things in, things in the vendor branch have a common parent with the FreeBSD tree, the empty repository. So in fact, there's a slash make file in both of them. And Git says, they've got common blank lines, squishes them together, and <laughs> really goes badly. The problem is actually, you don't care about that commit. It's not important. What you care about is the commit that merged that into the FreeBSD tree. So I changed the code to only pick the direct commits to the branch and merge each one of those one at a time. Um, I was going to do a demo here, but I'm getting a little short on time, so I think I will skip the demo and come back to it at the end, um, particularly since there's a bit of fussing with the projector to make it work. Um, so I alluded to be, so, so I alluded to before, um, rebase is broken, um, or, and I think it's again because rebase is applying all the commits individually rather than those individual merge commits. Um, so I've, it's on my list to attempt a uh, attempt a change to try applying those commits one at a time, basically re-implement re rebase. Um, should be doable, but I haven't done it yet. Um, I have an upcoming merge that looks like it's going to be exciting, so maybe I'll fix it then. Um, so I've got some to-dos for Mergeify. Um, I need to add this rebase mode, this bisect mode I've talked about before, where you can skip all the commits that don't make any sense to look at. Um, and one thing I would like to do eventually is it periodically, say maybe every 10 commits or every 100 commits, check that things build. Um, Right now, I don't get to do that, which is sometimes a little frustrating. I get to the end, and I discover Git botched a merge somewhere, or I botched a merge. Um, my current workflow is anytime I do anything by hand, I assume I screwed it up um, and do a full build just to make sure that it's right. Um, but I'd really like to do it every commit. Um, that would be really slow. Um, right now, it takes several seconds to merge each change, because Git is fast. But even if it's all in RAM on a fast machine, FreeBSD's repo is big. Um, so this would take quite a bit longer, but hopefully um, Simon Garrity's meta mode will make it fast enough that I could you know, try every 10 commits or so, and I could bisect within that once, once I knew what was going on. 
So on to another topic, upstreaming. Um, the best way to remove co merge conflicts, of course, is to upstream your changes. Um, that way, they become everyone else's merge conflicts and not mine. Um, <laughs> and if that section of the make file is the same, then you know things are good. Um, particularly the top level make files in FreeBSD, I have made so many changes to them, I get conflicts all the time, um, which is a bit annoying. So there's some questions of what to upstream. I think it's, there's some philo philosophical questions here. Um, the answers will vary depending on your project, the nature of your work. Um, obviously, drivers for things that people can use should be upstreamed. Um, and drivers are one of the better things to upstream as the owner of the driver, because it means when somebody changes the infrastructure, they have to update your driver. And you don't have to come along three months later and say, what the heck happened? Why does my driver not work anymore? Why does it not compile? Um, that sort of thing. Um, also, general infrastructure. We've built quite a lot of infrastructure along the way, so we've been upstreaming that as we can um, or as we have time. Um, so things that are shared by multiple external consumers, I, I, would, I like to try to upstream things that are useful to multiple people, even if they're not useful to most consumers of the project or not entirely useful in the base system. If you do a cleanup that doesn't that is critical to you, but doesn't matter to the base system, but other people are using it, I think that's a good thing to upstream. But that's a little tricky um, in that those are the sort of things that get broken. Um, and I've had some issues with that. Um, and also, things that are just low, are low impact and are likely to generate conflict. So we actually have a new signal that we've been meaning to upstream because Capsicum might use it eventually. It won't immediately, but Every time someone adds a new symbol, it a new signal, it creates a ton of conflicts because in every single case, it's adding something in exactly all the spots we changed. Um, so I think we'll upstream sig sigprot um, um, soon. So things we have upstreamed, um, FDT support for MIPS, so flattened device tree. Um, it was there, it didn't really work. Um, we fixed that. Bunch of drivers, um, bunch of driver improvements. Um, we added a way to turn on the floating point support that was in the kernel, um, and then we made it actually work um, for MIPS. We added, a MIPS, added bootloaders for MIPS. Um, we've added the un unprivileged build stuff. It's a bunch of other stuff. Um, been at it for four years now, so um, lots of things. We also have some sort of related upstreaming we've been doing, not to FreeBSD, but to other projects. <laughs> So if you saw Stacy and Sean's talk uh, earlier today, um, the QMU user mode work that's letting us build ARM and, ARM and MIP64 packages, which will soon be official, um, that's work we did because we needed packages. Um, turns out we don't actually use them very much right now, but uh, notionally we knew we were gonna wanna do demos without a tree code eventually. So we needed some way to build them other than trying to build, you know, QT or something on 100 megahertz MIPS. Um, didn't seem like a good idea. Meantime, to reboot due to power failure would be an issue. Um, so we've done a lot of improvements to Clang and LLVM on MIPS 64. Um, the imagination technology people's focus is definitely on little Endian 32-bit MIPS and we're big, big Endian 64-bit MIPS, so we've had to fix a lot of things. Um, and I've been upstreaming stuff to TCP dump um, mostly to make my life e easier merge-wise, um, but they seem to like the direction, the compartmentalization direction, so that's nice. Um, internally, we've, so we've been doing re some releases, we've done them internally for a long time, mostly snapshots. Um, initially, it would be periodically, I would do a release build um, using our little build system and push something out and put it on the wiki. Um, We've done a couple of restricted releases to partners. Uh, one of the problems we have is with the FPGA, the license agreements mean you can't share compiled bit files. Um, so we give them out to a few people who are in the program and we know have licenses, but um, it's sort of the, the uh, AT&T Unix problem that Kirk's alluded to. Um, and we've started doing public releases. So we just did our first pub public release uh, three weeks ago, I think. So cherrycpu.org. Um, you can download our CPU, you can compile it. Um, don't run the one, that, the bit file that comes out without some 
careful testing because at least the ones that our Jenkins build is producing, the fan doesn't work. Um, it seems to run okay as long as you don't do too much. Then it gets hot and things misbehave. Um, so another small change of gears, since my focus on this is a FreeBSD developer, some tips for developers, um, many of which go around the idea of, you know, as you develop new things like new ways to build the kernel or new ways to build the OS, you spend an awful lot of time compiling. So I've got some suggestions for ways to, ways to deal with this. The first and probably most important one, use a big enough machine. Um, seriously, if somebody is paying you to wait for compiles, they can buy quite a lot of hardware fairly quickly um, for what they're paying you. Um, you, uh, you need enough, my view is you want enough RAM to hold all the source and all the output. Um, we know 128 gigs is enough. John Anderson has one that's working well for him. The machine we use is a 256 gig machine. Um, we have fast disk, fast ZFS, uh, a Z pool or a Z mirror um, with a half terabyte of SSD. Um, works pretty well. Um, I would say that, you know, you know, 120, 200, 128 gigs should be enough. 256 gigs definitely should be enough for anyone, except last week when there was a compiler bug um, and we had a dozen Clang processes using 70, 70 gigabytes a piece. Um, we ran out of swap. Um, it was exciting. Um, and it turns out, it, well, they ran out of swap and then they started dumping core. And uh, you can't kill processes that are dumping core, so that was unfortunate. Uh, <laughs> But usually it's big enough, and we literally could not do the work we're doing without this machine. Um, it's only about $5,000. It's definitely worth it. Um, another thing that I've found really helpful is a, uh, I, I use a little notifi push notification service that has a REST interface. So the one I use is uh, pushover.net. Um, there's a web browser-based client that's 10 bucks. And there's Android and iOS, which also are 10 bucks a piece to activate. You can write the service for that, so it's totally worth it. Um, and I have a little command line wrapper, so I run this command notice, run a command, and then I get something like this on my screen in a Bing, and my phone buzzes. Um, and it's really great at reducing the latency between, well, my compile finished, and I noticed that it finished. Um, so that's, that's been really helpful. Um, another thing, I build everything in TMUX sessions. And actually, one of the things that I discovered partway through is it's really important to switch away from the build. Do not send it over the network. Even over gigabit locally, enough stuff buffers that it significantly delays your ability to get back to the prompt. <laughs> um, so better to not render it at all. Um, that was slightly surprising. I found that at Cambridge. Like, eh, you know, I knew it was an issue over the Atlantic or I would switch away when I was tethering, so I didn't just waste all that bandwidth. But it turns out, yeah, always switch away. Um, and I guess one final little tip, continuous integration is really great. Um, we do full, full OS builds after every compiler or OS change. Um, they take about 20 minutes. Um, we also do full releases at least a couple times a day. Um, keeps everything working. And one of the key things for us is because our architecture is weird and we are making strange changes, um, we build both you know, Cherry, MIP64, and AMD64 all the time. AMD64 is actually a really good canary because it also builds i3d6 libraries. Um, so that means we build a whole lot of stuff and just keeps us honest. Um, you know, we, are, we are a research project, but we really want this stuff to be used for real. So we don't want to get to veer down some blind alley in code changes and then come back and say, oh, I have three months of work to get this thing functional again um, or into the shape where I could merge it. So we do that all the time. Um, and also when we're working on a release now, we create a separate set of Jenkins jobs to build the release daily um, in the release branch just to make sure everything sta is stable. Um, I'll mention some of our papers that we've got published. We have three top tier papers in the last year. Um, had a Cherry um, hardware paper. Um, actually, let's see. Yes. Oh, well, okay. So here's the hardware paper. 
cherry cap the cherry capability model, revisiting risk in an age of risk. Um, that's kind of mostly what I talked about earlier. We have beyond the PDP-11, uh, processor support for a, a memory, say a C abstract machine, that was an ass boss. Um, if you're a C geek, it's a great paper. Um, I definitely recommend it. I learned all sorts of weird things about C writing the paper, so that was fun. Um, and then we had a compartmentalization paper at IEEE Security and Privacy um, a few weeks ago. There's also an ISA document and whatnot on the Cambridge website. A bit of future work here. Um, so we have, we're working on a pure capability for eBSD. Um, so probably it'd be a very long time, even once hardware exists, um, before you'll ship a version of FreeBSD that only uses pure capability code. But it's pretty likely that you'll want to run um, a fair bit of pure capability code. And we also realized recently that the best way to get a ton of code running is to be able to have a pure capability build within FreeBSD so we can just compile everything and try to use it, run it through the test suite and see what happens. Um, it'll no doubt be exciting. Um, we're also working on, we'd like to add Cherry to the kernel. Um, we have, the code we have in there is all um, assembly or macros around inline assembly. Um, it works for what we're doing, but we'd like to be able to do things like protect mbuffs, protect storage buffers, um, compartmentalize the kernel, make it into a microkernel. Um, and we're hoping eventually, well, so one of the other things, as I said, you know, early on, 256 bits is a pretty big pointer. Um, there'll be lots of overhead um, in terms of cache footprint and whatnot. Um, in extraordinarily pointer heavy benchmarks, it's about 20% uh, performance overhead, which is not acceptable. Um, so we were working on 128 bit compressed capabilities. Um, some interesting trade offs we're exploring. We're pretty confident it's going to work, but there are a lot of details. Um, and in our simulations, that should get the overhead down to about 3% in a benchmark that's basically data structures that are pointers. <coughs> um, and then we're also looking at non-MIPS architectures. So happy to answer any questions. I just threw up uh, along here our timelines. We've been at this about five years now. Um, I'm guessing we've got over 50 years of work into it. Um, and we've got quite a bit to go. But uh, it's a fun project. And uh, I think we've done a lot of interesting development and stuff that's generally useful for FreeBSD along the way. Any questions? Yes. So your continuous integration stuff, are you uh, synthesizing parallel stuff uh, and then running your compiled software on that, like full stack integration, or? Yes. Um, we're actually, so we're actually using um, BlueSpec system Verilog, um, which is a Haskell-derived HDL. Um, we both compile it, so it, it has a mode to compile to a cycle-accurate C simulator. Um, so we've done, been doing that for a long time. More recently, we have actually, we've started synthesizing bit files, loading them onto FPGAs, and then running the operating system on them. Yeah, that's Jenkins. It's, the Jenkins cluster has grown quite a lot over the last year. Um, on the hardware side, one of the RAs is amazingly patient and willing to deal with broken junk. Is that part of your infrastructure open source? Um, no, I don't think so. Um, parts of it might be in the release. I'd have to go look. Um, if you want to ask me later, I can take a, take a poke at the GitHub repo of what we've actually put out and what's buried in the Jenkins config. No, this is not the Cloud ABI work. Um, I probably should have gone to the Cloud ABI talk before, but I've talked to it a bit. Um, I think, so what we're doing is adding a new uh, syscall ABI. So like the, I th like the 32, lib32 and the 32-bit, uh, or FreeBSD32 emulation, we're adding a Cherry ABI. Um, it's sort of the first cut. Not clear what the long-term right answer is, but that's one we know how to do. Um, so I did a first pass at syscalls.master, and the great thing is you take all the lines that say compat, and clear them out because we've never shipped with those versions, and we never will. <laughs> well, 
Thank you all for coming. If you have any questions later, feel free to talk to me.